next special guest, one of the all-time greats. Melissa. Gentlemen, I was talking to David Parkin on the telephone this week. He said he'd love to be on the show. So here he is, David Parkin. Mm. Good on you, David. Yeah, you Thanks for joining us on Grumpy Old Men. I'll be back again. Oh. <laughs> now, you made big news about 12 months ago as a four-time premiership coach uh, with Hawthorne and also with Carlton. You said the modern game of football is boring. Grumpy, grumpy. Grumpy. Ooh, it was a bad grumpy choice coach. of words. I meant to say predictable. But you didn't. Oh, I didn't. I did say boring, and it caught me about four weeks of my life, I reckon. And the AFL came well, down on you like oh, a ton of bricks? Oh, no, but a lot of people were, thought it was inappropriately timed and that the season was about a week away and it wasn't going to encourage people to go. But I saw a grand final on Saturday night, and I'd have to say there were a lot of blokes behind the ball, a lot of blokes flooding back into the opposition forward line. It wasn't a great game to watch, and I think if footy's going to be played like that all the time, I don't know that it is, then a lot more people will see... Stay at who home. discovered that flooding? Who, who actually designed that flooding? Oh, well, anybody designed, I think, uh, you know, Rocket Eden and a few others because of the, maybe the size of the Sydney ground, the fact that we've got fit enough. It's no different to any other territorial team game in the world. Mm. Soccer plays that way, hockey plays that way, European handball plays that way, water polo plays that way, basketball plays that way, so wouldn't Australian footy play that way. It's just that we've got a bigger ground. Now we've got them fit enough to run up and down mm. all day. If they're not, we all them off and put another bloke on. And we've got them good enough with their skills now to keep possession of this oblong shaped ball like they do with all the round balls they play. What so about, what it's a natural consequence of where every territorial team game in the world's gone. What about David, uh, uh, John Kennedy and the Commandos, did you actually train as hard as they do nowadays? We didn't train as... We, tr we trained very hard in those days, Bob, there's no doubt we did. We didn't train as often. Yeah. And I think they're, they're actually able to get themselves to another level because of the, of the amount of training they do. I don't know that we go as long these days, but it's more intense and it's more often. So we've got enormous capacity to run and that's what the game's about. I think we've got a lot of blokes who are... Great footballers playing around the suburbs mm. who don't have got a chance to play AFL footy because they simply can't run. And we've got a few blokes playing AFL footy, are fantastic runners, but yeah. they're not nearly as good but as the can't get the ball. What, what about the kids, <laughs> David? Do you, the same passion that you had as a youngster when you were starting the game, I know that I live for football. Do you think the kids have got it this, at this many, stage? There are too many alternatives, Tone. I reckon there, yeah. there are lots of alternatives other than footy that are easy to play, probably just as enjoyable. And, you go to schools now and you find they're sitting at lunchtime on their computers in the classroom, mm. not outside kicking a footy round like we might have done. In the so street, you never see it, do you? Hardly ever parks. see it, no. I've got a oval opposite me and you hardly ever see kids uh, kicking the ball like we used to do. Yeah. David, let's bring back some memories. Uh, 1971, you were captain of Hawthorne, you won the uh, Premiership and of course uh, you also coached the Hawks to a Premiership as well. So let's relive some of these great memories from 1971. Now just some of the, uh, the stars that we can see playing here for St Kilda. This was a, a very close grand final, a tough grand final. And there's David Park with very sure ball handling. <laughs> oh, I got the Round the neck. I was going to say, you ought to get this travel too far. I reckon gave him four goals. With that was just a wobbly old punt kick then, David. No, no thought of going back and, you know, keeping possession. Nice little drop punt to one of your teammates. Uh, our game was pretty simple. Get it as, you know, get the ball, kick it as far as you can. Start a brawl, get the ball, kick it as far as you can. Start another brawl. So it was a very simple game Not plan. Not four or five down. <laughs> Oh, this was a very famous... Can I, I want to recapture that one. Well, I didn't even know that happened. You were an umpire's <laughs> favourite, weren't you? Yeah, you I was. A few yeah. free kicks, there, yeah. <laughs> this was a famous grand final because uh, the Hawks were down at three-quarter time. Big comeback. Yeah, Leon Rice kicked one, just a ripper off his left foot out of the pocket just prior to three-quarter time, which gave us a bit of hope. But uh, Bob Kenny took over, I think... Uh, his last quarter performance was uh, just fantastic. The mutton chops were in vogue in those days, weren't they? The Scottish, one of Scotty's best kicks I've ever seen, man. <laughs> There's a strong tackle by yourself. And, of course, this was a game where Peter Hudson was expected to kick more than 150 goals and pass Bob Pratt's all-time record of 150. Yeah, it's, a, it's a fantastic piece of history, that, isn't it? But the bloke who uh, would, have, would have, I think, made that record, I mean, he now shares it with Bob Pratt. I think it's probably something nice in that. But uh, I think Peter got stuck in shows you how smart Lawrence was on the mark to actually uh, Is that a that true era. story, David? It's not one of the myths, that business about Lawrence going back and coming up and doing all that yeah, business. Yeah, no, it's an absolute true story. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Yep. No, Pete wasn't with it for a lot of the time, I think. No, that I think famous story about the pre-match address, I think, was pretty much right. If Hutto had we played said, we today. Said, we've got to keep, keep Hutto down to six goals. and I think the Blake said... Uh, if, yeah. he, if he's not stand up, he won't be able to kick six at all. Was that Cowboy Neil put I his think hand that's up? the man. You said that, not me. But and a I big punch at the back of the ear. Yeah, yeah. I had a look at his ear at quarter time, and that's it certainly right. was in two sections at quarter time. So mm. the he fact thought he was going to be Chopper Reed, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and if Hutto had played today, he would have marked the ball 
gone up to the mark and scraped it with his boot to say, I'm kicking, that's the mark. And he would have done it Monday. He inquired of the umpire three times yeah, where the mark exactly. was. I don't know how that Just to hold up play a little bit longer. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. David, uh, you coached Hawks to a premiership and then, of course, uh, you went to Carlton. Like a lot of great coaches, Tommy Hafey, of course, who joined us recently, uh, went to Collingwood and also to Geelong and, and, uh, and South Melbourne or Sydney as they were known then. How come you went to Carlton from Hawthorne? Because you'd played all your football there since 61, you'd learned all your coaching under John Kennedy, you coached the club to a premiership, then all of a sudden David Parkin was gone. It's a similar story, I think, to, uh, to Tommy, actually. We, we'd failed, we won one in 78, failed to make the finals with, I think, a group of players that should have made the finals in 79 and 80. So my time was up there, I think, as that, at that stage of my career. And I resigned, the same as Tommy did. They, they accepted it with undue haste, I thought, but... Uh, <laughs> I was lucky enough. <laughs> you didn't <laughs> resign thinking they're going to say, yeah, no, 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 don't, no, don't, don't resign. I think they'd ask me back oh, when they, they didn't I love this. Here. Everyone that's come on, no, I didn't get the sack. I resigned. <laughs> looks better on the CV, Bob. Oh, but I, have, I, I have been sacked. Though. Jack, <laughs> Jack, uh, Jack Elliott sacked me about four times, only once publicly, but about three other times privately. This is after you won back to back premierships with Carl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack got rid of me in 85, having reappointed me, mind you, reappointed me. And for 10 days, I was coaching up the next year, and I had Kernan and. Dorotich and Bradley and all these players come. I thought, how lucky is this? But Robert Walls became available and I hadn't got my contract signed, so I was out the door. But fortunately for me, I was able to swap with Robert Walls. He now, came that was an amazing it. sequence, wasn't it? That yeah. Robert Walls went to Carlton and you went to Fitzroy. And I have to say, it was a terrific time. The first couple of years were great at Fitzroy. Last year was pretty tough stuff, but probably my best coaching effort, to be truthful, was taking Fitzroy to third in... Uh, in 1986, if I was being honest with that, because I think they played as close to their potential as any group of players I've ever ever had the privilege of uh, coaching. You must have looked forward to getting up in the morning, opening up the paper, and just seeing what Jack Ken uh, John Elliott was going to say. You, you must have loved that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Just yeah. mouthing off. Sorry, it is different, Jack. Oh. Sorry to interrupt, but I do have a special treat for you. The specials today are Arnott Scotch Finger Biscuits. Oh, give them the now, we all know honey. that the Arnott Scotch Fingers are best for dipping, especially for those who don't have teeth of their own. Bob. Bobby. Bobby. Oh, don't be looking at me. My own teeth and own hair. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you for that. Pleasure. No, I'm on the diet. Oh, thanks, Melissa. Right. Taking care of the waistline there. Oh, Fabulous. Enjoy, lovely. gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Now, David, when did you discover that you were a professional or a career coach? Bob, I never became a professional or career coach. I'm one of those, even today, I still hold another job. I, I re always reckon it was too dangerous. <laughs> you wanted a bit of insurance in your back pocket. I hope the university aren't listening to this, but they've been my insurance for the last 30 years. <laughs> I see. So, so uh, when I'm out of work, I've still got another job to go to. You've actually been collecting two huge paychecks for a long, long time. And I've got it right now because I've been telling the university, Bob, I'm the footy club, and I've been telling the footy club I'm the university, my golf handicap's just gotten a single fence. <laughs> I'm going like a rocket. Did you do yourself out of a job, David? Because, look, it's famous. You've got Wayne Britton down at Carlton now as the coach that when you're the senior coach, you let Wayne come in and take over and talk to the players, coach them on match days. Now, in theory, it's a great idea, uh, sharing the workload, no, no, but did it cost you the coaching job down at Carlton? No, no, no. To be truthful, what people don't know, that 25 years ago, John Kennedy put his arm around my shoulders after a pre-season training session, 1977 it was, and said, David, tomorrow you'll be coach of the Hawthorne Footy Club. No interview, no going to board of directors. He gave me his job. The nice thing for me that 25 years later about, I was able to put my arm around Wayne Britton, put him up, and he, for really, for 1999 and, sorry, 1999 and 2000, Wayne was virtually coaching that team. It seemed right for me that if we could convince the committee that he was the bloke, he should get the job. And I'm delighted that that succession plan was put into place because that team was able to continue on exactly the same pathway rather than be an upheaval, new coach coming in, a whole lot of new ideas, new game plan. I thought that these people were on the way to do something pretty special together. So it's one of those better stories. I was gone in my own body and mind. It was time for me to move on and it was just nice to be a part of the process that had a young, young coach who I think is one of the great young coaches of the competition get a job when he hasn't been a league footballer. Mm. I mean, people forget yeah, that. He yeah, hasn't that's been a good through point. the he's had, his, had his starting point in the, uh, in the heartlands of Australian football, Cairns is where he started. <laughs> so for him to have worked, it's just a good story. And I hope that he and Carlton are able to have some success together because it's a good story. How difficult is it Sorry to Sorry about that, Bob, but we are at the end of our time on Grumpy Old Men. We've oh. got to thank David Parker for joining us. I'll be very grumpy us. if I don't get this question in. David, no, sorry, Bob, you'll have to keep it for another time. But, David, thanks for David. joining us on thanks Grumpy Old Men. and well, Thanks know. for joining us, one thanks of the all-time greats. And, of course, Tommy Hayfield also David. joined us on Grumpy Old Men. Next week, 
More superstars from the past on Grumpy Old Men.